are in week 10 of our Reconstructing Faith series, and um, I, I, I want, I'll say this right off the bat. The entire series uh, is culminating into the topic of what I'm preaching on today. Reconstructing Faith is a series um, where we set out 10 weeks ago to uh, every week would build on each other. We're going chronologically through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're looking at the life of Jesus and what he taught, and this series is about building a faith that will last so we know what to believe, why we believe it, and how to defend it. And all of the sermons are building to the topic of today, which is the cross. Last week, we looked at Pilate and Jesus' conversation at, at his trial. And Pilate, the Roman governor, is looking at Jesus, and they're talking about truth. And Pilate is looking at truth, the embodiment of truth in Jesus, saying, what is truth? And, and I taught on that last week. If you weren't here, I would, I would encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and check that out, but it, we are picking up right where we left off with that um, today, and how many of you guys have ever seen The Passion of the Christ, the movie? Uh, if you haven't, obviously I would highly encourage it, um, and, but a few years ago, oh, several years ago now, we were watching it as a family, and my oldest son, who's 16 now, but was uh, a lot younger then, we watched Passion of the Christ, and at the end of it, I looked at my kids, and you're hoping like when you watch a movie like that, your kids just fall down on their knees like they're at an altar call and give their lives to Jesus, you know? And so I look over, like, what'd you guys think? And Aiden goes, he's eating popcorn. He goes, that was good. Is there a sequel? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so in the next couple weeks, we're gonna get to the sequel, but today, guys, we're at the cross, and we can't bypass the cross to get to the sequel of the resurrection. We, we've, got to, we've got to look at the cross, so today, I, what I want to encourage you with and what I want to challenge you with, if you're a Christian in here, you're probably thinking, oh man, this is the day I could have taken off because I know everything there is to know about the cross. But I'm going to challenge you to dig deeper today. I'm going to challenge you to look at the cross again and to make sure that we've understood the meaning of what Jesus did on the cross and that that meaning has actually gone from our minds to our hearts at a level of transformation where something has shifted and we are the new creation that the experience of the cross is supposed to bring. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, uh, starting in verse 45. This is gonna be our passage in a few minutes that I'm gonna pull our points out of. And it says this, starting in 45. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus is on the cross. He is in the process of dying, and he cries this out, okay? Why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah, and one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after, after, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. That statement, truly, this is the Son of God, acknowledging that, having faith in that, declaring that, is what saves us. What experience have you had that has led you to the moment where you said, truly, Jesus is the Son of God? What experience has led you there? I wanna start today chronologically right where we left off last week, Jesus was talking with, G or I'm sorry, Jesus was talking with Pilate, and Pilate takes Jesus out uh, to the courtyard on the platform overlooking the crowd that was wanting to crucify him, and he says, I find no fault in this man. Pilate might have viewed him as losing his mind or a little crazy, but not worth the death penalty and certainly not God, and his claims to be king were nothing to him. The crowd was so angry at Jesus because they were the Jewish leaders who had stirred up the crowd, they were so angry because Jesus was claiming to be their Messiah. Remember, it was the Jews who were waiting on a Messiah. And Jesus had come to, and to say, it's me. The one you've been waiting for is me. But they didn't like 
his methodology. They didn't like that he was coming to be a humble servant. They wanted him to come in and overthrow Rome. They didn't like the fact that he was coming in and challenging them, the religious leaders. So this could not be the Messiah to them. And so they dismissed him, and now they become so angry, they were wanting to kill him. People become so angry even today at Jesus. The greatest reason people become so angry at the church and Jesus and God is because of misple- misplaced expectations. We have expectations on what Jesus is, is supposed to do in our lives, who he's supposed to be. We think, well, I was raised in church and things didn't turn out the way I wanted, and so I get angrier and angrier. God let this happen, he let that happen, and it turns into what God is supposed to do for us rather than us doing what we're supposed to do for God, right? We serve the God of the universe. The God of the universe does not serve us. And the moment we flip those is the moment anger and bitterness and resentment begins to rise up in us. So after this little portion of what's going on with Pilate and Jesus, Pilate has what I think is a pretty genius idea. Pilate knows that Passover is about to start And Passover is the uh, biggest Jewish celebration festival holiday of the entire year. And every year it was a custom at that point to release a a prisoner for the Jews. And so he had this idea. Jesus is technically a prisoner at that moment. He didn't want to completely give in to the crowd, but he also didn't want to disappoint them because if he went against the crowd, they would rise up with an uprising and riots, and Pilate's main job commissioned by Caesar was to keep chaos and rioting and uprisings to a minimum. Because at that time, that's what Jerusalem was known for, and it was creating a headache for the Roman Empire. You guys following? So so Pilate is feeling this pressure. I've, I've got to maintain order. I don't want an uprising, but I also don't want to kill an innocent man because he took execution seriously. So he looks at the crowd and says, it's a custom to release one of your prisoners every year at Passover. I have an idea. He pulls out a man named Barabbas, who was a known murderer, leader of insurrections. He was the leader of uprising and riots. He was a brutal um, man who had killed even many of the people's family members who were in the crowd. And then he pulls Jesus out. And Pilate's assuming, in the comparison, they're going to be like, oh, okay, release Jesus. But when he said, which one do you want us to? Well, I want us to release, the crowd began to chant Barabbas. And that's the moment Pilate knew he could not stop that train. In Matthew 27, starting in verse 20, it says this, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for, for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They answered, crucify him. This was an angry, angry crowd. The reason why I wanted to start with this part of the story with Barabbas is because I like to place myself correctly into the story of the Bible. Like sometimes, I'll give you an example, sometimes we like to put ourselves in the position of David in the story of David and Goliath. But we aren't David in the story of David and Goliath. We are the Israelites on the sideline who need a champion on our behalf to come in to destroy the giant. See what I'm saying? So where we place ourselves in the stories is really important. Who we are in the story of Barabbas and Jesus and Pilate, we're actually Barabbas. Everything in the Bible points to the cross. Old Testament stories, when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, points to the cross. Moses at the burning bush points to the cross. Jonah jumping overboard into the sea points to the cross. Even stories in the New Testament point to the cross. And this story of Jesus, Barabbas, and Pilate points to the cross, which is about to happen. Why? It illustrates what happens at the moment of salvation. At the moment of salvation, acknowledging Jesus as Savior, the person who is truly guilty, the shackles come off, if you call on the name of Jesus, because the Bible says we have all fallen, we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we are guilty. We deserve the penalty of our sin, the book of Romans says. But when we call in the name of Jesus, the guilty person, the shackles come off, and we walk down those steps like Barabbas did. Can you imagine being Barabbas, thinking you were going to die in prison, looking back over your shoulder at Jesus? He had already been beaten at that point. His beard pulled out of his face. His eyes would have been bloodshot. And Barabbas is looking over his shoulder at Jesus, 
thinking, how is this possible that I get to go free, but this innocent man is taking my place? Have you ever had that moment in salvation? You might have raised your hand in a church service. You might have said a prayer. But have you ever had the moment, figuratively speaking, spiritually speaking, where you're walking down those steps and you look back over your shoulder at Jesus, this innocent man with compassion and mercy in his eyes, who is taking your place, taking on your penalty as you go free. That's what happens at the moment of salvation. We are Barabbas. Jesus got what Barabbas deserved and Barabbas got what Jesus deserved. Jesus got on the cross what we deserved and we, because of the cross, got what Jesus deserved, righteousness. I wanna go through a timeline real quick of what happened that night. From the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested, a lot of people don't understand the speed of what was happening and why it happened at this time. We went to Israel a couple years ago and I told you that we're going again next fall, next November. If you're interested in going on that trip, please go to our website, check that out. It is life-changing and completely, it'll change everything how you see scripture. I wanna show you a timeline of what's going on here and I think this will really help you understand some context of what's going on. The first thing on the timeline is between six and 9 p.m. on Thursday night was the Last Supper. Um, and it was in the southwest Jerusalem at a house, and this is when Judas leaves um, to go get soldiers. The next thing on the timeline, at 10 p.m., Jesus and his disciples leave that house and go to the Garden of Gethsemane in the Kidron Valley, just northeast of old Jerusalem. Between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. was Jesus' arrest. They bind him and take him to his first trial at Anna's residence, um, he was the previous high priest, and then they went to Caiaphas's residence, who was the current high priest at that time, okay? And this is also when Peter denies that he's a disciple or follower of Jesus. At 5 a.m., it's early daybreak, uh, the first light of dawn in the sky, following the trial, the rooster crows at Peter's third denial, um, and Jesus is now being taken to Pilate's praetorium. So I want you to see the speed of this. So Jesus is arrested at night, and he's awake all night praying. Um, he's now arrested, he's taken to his first few trials, he's already been beaten up, they haven't let him sleep, he's already to the point of exhaustion, and it's 5 a.m., okay? Pilate, hearing he's from Galilee, sends Jesus to Herod's residence close by. Herod questions him considerably, but gets no answers. His soldiers clothe Jesus in a robe, uh, probably a white robe. It was, looked like a royal robe to mock Jesus because people had been calling him and he had called himself the king of the Jews. And so Herod wants nothing to do with him. He's just making fun of him. Jesus won't perform for him and do miracles. So he sends him back to Pilate. At 7 a.m. that morning, that Friday morning, is the trial before Pilate. And Jesus is whipped and beaten. So this is happening very quickly. What I wanna talk about just for a second is the part where he's whipped and beaten. He was whipped and beaten with something called a cat of nine tails, which is a whip on the left-hand side. There's a wooden handle, leather strands. On the end of it were small bone pieces and also little metal shards, and then there were metal balls on the ends of these strands. Um, they were whipped, some people say 39 times. That, was, that came later. It could have been 39. It could have been more, to be honest, when you really look at history. But the whole purpose of the cat of nine tails, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because we have to understand what Jesus had to go through, what he did go through for us, okay? And I'll explain why in a second. So you look at this whip, and at the end of the whip was bones, heavier metal balls, and then also little metal shards. The metal balls, as they would whip, would hit the flesh first, and they would come up and come down in that motion on um, the prisoner's back, on the victim's back. When the metal balls would hit first, because they're heavier, they would come first, they would soften the flesh, they would soften the flesh, so when the bones and metal shards hit the back, the flesh was soft enough to where they would go under the skin, grab the skin and flesh, and rip off when the soldier would bring the upward motion off of the flesh. And they would do this over and over and over again on both sides of the back and both sides on the front. You know, there's an Old Testament prophecy and then also later documentation from people like Josephus, old church fathers, that wrote about the cat of nine tails and what it would do to the human body. Josephus wrote, not about Jesus, but another person he witnessed being whipped and beaten with the cat of nine tails. After the flogging was over, when they would, would flip them over, all of the flesh had been ripped off of the rib cage on the front and back, and he documented that he could see the man's beating heart 
through the thin layers of flesh because all the skin had been ripped off. Isaiah, or in the Old Testament, also talks about, in prophecy, about how Jesus on this day would be so mangled that he would more resemble an animal than a human being as he carried his cross to Golgotha and as he hung on the cross. A lot of the depictions that we see, sure, we'll see a little bit of blood on Jesus' hands, on those beautiful crucifixes in, in churches and, and tattoos or necklaces, whatever we have, and none of those things are bad. But sometimes we've turned how brutal this event was into something beautiful because human beings love relics to worship. We love worshiping things. We don't love worshiping a God we can't see, so we have to have something. And we don't want that something, the symbol of Christianity, to be that ugly, so we have to make it beautiful. We have to make it a decoration in church. We have to make it a decoration in jewelry. Again, fine, I'm not saying that's bad. A decoration on a tattoo. But if we limit it to that, we'll never understand really what the cross was. The cross was only beautiful because the end result, but everything before that was brutal to the point we could, pos- we could never possibly fully understand. So after the whipping was over, between seven and 9 a.m., all of that was happening, he was beaten, and by 9 a.m., Jesus had already carried the cross, okay, already carried the cross to Golgotha. 9 a.m., the crucifixion starts. 12 noon, the sun grows dark, as the story tells, and 3 p.m. were Jesus' last words and death. So I wanted you guys to see this because all of this is happening in around a 24-hour window. Sometimes when you're seeing this, you think it's like days and days and days. It could be fast. There can be some little variances in the schedule on that, but it was within 24 hours-ish. Speed, speed, speed. One of the things I wanna show you real quick, and when I first saw that, I'm like, how could they do all of that? Like Jesus is going to like people's houses for a trial. Then he's going to Herod. He's at Pilate's twice. How is he going to all these places? And what was astonishing is when we were in Israel, in the old city, Jerusalem, and they're gonna put a diagram up, we were actually stood on top of Herod's temple. That top piece, way at the top, I know these letters, these words are way too small to see, but just visually, we stood on top of that, looking at old city, Jerusalem. And if you look kind of up toward the center, down just a little bit, there's a smaller little walled area, looks like a dotted... um, line that has black, that's old city Jerusalem, and right outside that, there's some wording that says Golgotha. So this outer ring came later. It was way up there. So when you're standing on Herod's temple, you can see Golgotha, where he was crucified, right next to it. Guys, I'm talking, I can throw a rock from where Jesus was crucified to where he was buried. The entire old city Jerusalem is about the size of Albuquerque's old town. It is that small. It's, it was mind-blowing how fast they could make this happen. If you notice the times, too, this starts at night and ends in the morning. By the time Jesus was carrying the cross out of old city Jerusalem, he had already been convicted, tried, and sentenced to death, and he's carrying his cross. Now remember, Jesus had just come in a few days earlier on Palm Sunday, and thousands of people greeted him along the streets, waving palm branches, singing Hosanna, declaring him to be the son of God. Where did all those people go? I I, Honestly, I had grown up reading the story thinking the entire crowd just flip-flopped on Jesus. Some, maybe. But when you really look at the intentions of why the Jewish leaders started this at night, they wanted all of this to be done, and they wanted Jesus on the way to be executed while all of Jesus' supporters were asleep. So by the time Jesus was carrying his cross to Golgotha, Everyone who could have or would have tried to stop it were seeing him carrying the cross, and it was too late. The weeping and the wailing began. It's what they woke up to. Now, I'm not saying I wanted that to change because all of this happened in accordance to God's will because of his sovereignty, but I'm telling you the intention of man in this story was not good. I wanted you guys to see that timeline because it helps bring context to everything. So by the time Jesus gets to the cross, he's mangled, completely mangled, to the point where he couldn't even carry the crossbar. He wasn't carrying the whole cross to Golgotha. He was carrying the crossbar. He couldn't even carry that because his body was so weakened. Flesh hanging off of him, beard half ripped out, his hair half ripped out, the crown of thorns dug into his skull, and he's carrying this crossbar, and he gets to the cross. In the late 80s, there was a 
an article from the American Medical Association. The article was called On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. And these doctors were interviewed and asked to do studies assuming that Jesus died and died this way. Assuming the biblical text is correct, they asked medical doctors, non-Christians, non-Christian doctors, to talk about what could have caused Jesus' death. And I want to read three of these quotes from these doctors from this article. The first doctor said, Jesus would have been suspended with much of his weight borne by his arms with his legs bent under him. In the classic symptoms of crucifixion, the position would have almost immediately started to reduce his respiratory capacity, initiating a gradual lessening of the oxygen being mixed into his bloodstream and setting the stage for eventual, eventual asphyxiation. Another doctor said, suffering would have been intense since, every, since severe muscle, and severe muscle cramps agonizing, shooting pain from the nerve injuries and the struggle to maintain breathing by lifting the weight of his body with his arms could have been combined with such discomforts as insects uh, burrowing into his ears, eyes, and nose, and birds of prey attacking the wounds. Another doctor said, eventually the combination of blood loss before the crucifixion and the toll of the ordeal itself would have brought on something called hypovolemic shock, a state similar to what occurs in severe bleeding victims who are about to die. Eventually, the stress on Jesus' respiratory system would have precipitated symptoms like those of congestive heart failure and blood clots would have begun to form on the major arteries or valves of the heart. Eventually, in the last moments of Christ's agony, one of the clots may have broken loose, precipitating a catastrophic heart seizure that would account for the biblical descriptions of an apparently climactic final moment of agony. I know this is heavier today. I want this to be contemplated for you, and honestly, I do want it to be heavy for you. I feel like we have turned the crucifixion into something it was never meant to be turned into. The cross is meant to look at, contemplate, and it's meant to be so powerful that just the reality of what happened on that cross instantly changes people's eternities and instantly changes people's lives. Has it ever been that powerful for you? Today, I wanna to focus on two of the statements Jesus made with the remainder of our time today while he was on the cross that hopefully will bring, shed a little bit more light and bring um, a little bit more clarity to you about what he did and why he did that on the cross. The first statement is this. It comes from Matthew 27, uh, verse 46, and it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? forsaken me. I remember being a little kid and, and listening to that part and reading that part of the story and listening to preachers preach that part and thinking, okay, why did you forsake him, God? Father, like, what was happening right there? Why did you forsake him? Why are these words so important? But in Matthew 27, verse 46, I'll read the actual verse. It says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out loud, in and in, out loud in a voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's important. Jesus cried, cried, cried. That Greek word, and I say this a lot, but sometimes English words do not do the original wording justice. Most of the time compared to Greek, English is a very weak language and we can't pull out of it what was meant to be pulled out of it. The original Greek word uh, pronounced anaboao means this, to raise a cry, to cry out, or a war cry, another theologian said a shriek, a loud shriek. That's what that word means. I want you to notice something though. So Jesus is screaming right here, screaming, not whimpering, screaming. But notice everything Jesus has endured up until this point. Beatings, the whipping of the cat of nine tails, the crown of thorn being, thorns being driven into his head, carrying the cross, the abandonment and betrayal of family and friends, his beard being ripped out, hair being ripped out, spit on, mocked, all of those different things, the nails through his feet, the nails through his hands, he endured all of that, and the Bible never records one cry. Not a whimper, not a yell, not a cry. He may have, but the Bible doesn't record it, and what the Bible records is very important, very important. Why? Why at that moment was Jesus shrieking, screaming, a war cry level pain? What was so painful about that moment? 
that none of those things that he had endured, none of those things pale in comparison to what was happening there in that moment. What was it? In that moment, God the Father had to turn his back, his shoulder, turn his back on Jesus. What was so painful about that moment? What was painful about that moment to Jesus and what caused him to scream in that much agony is that was the exact moment that all of the penalty for every person that would ever live, that would ever call on the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it was that second and that moment that the penalty for those sins came upon him and he bore that penalty and it was so heavy that he let out a war cry and a shriek and a scream that everyone around could have heard. Now my whole life when I've heard this story and when people talk about Jesus on the cross, he'll say, well, Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and we say, yes, and Jesus took my place on that cross, yes. But have you ever stopped to think, what is the penalty for our sin? Romans says the wages of sin is death, but not physical death, eternal death. The wages of sin is eternal separation from God and what I preached on a few weeks ago called hell. Jesus wasn't just taking your place to die a figurative death and to pay a figurative penalty. What caused God incarnate, God become man to scream in agony was taking on our eternal punishment of hell so we don't have to. What I would have endured outside of Christ, Jesus said, you're so worth it and I love you so much, I will endure it so you don't ever have to even think about it. When Jesus was going to the cross, he wasn't thinking about humanity. He was thinking about you. What kept him going to the, to the cross? He was God and man. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he actually prayed and said, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, the cup of responsibility, that cup of wrath, take it from me. And he said, nevertheless, your will be done. What caused him to keep going? I caused him to keep going. You caused him to keep going. Our sin nature, every sin you would do in, in secrecy, every time we would turn our back on him, every time we go back to that substance and back to that thing and back to our past life, every single time, he still loved us anyways. And he said, I'm still going to the cross for you. It has to be done. In that moment, God had to turn his back on Jesus because God the Father cannot gaze upon and be in the presence of evil and sin. Now I've always heard that and thought, was well, God not strong enough to be in the presence of evil? You know, he is. But if evil and sin enters the presence of God, it has to die. Jesus took on our evil, took on our sin, and all we have to do is call in the name of Jesus, and we'll, we will be saved. Here's a lighter note. There's another time in the New Testament that that exact Greek word is used to describe a shriek and a shout and a war cry. One other time in the New Testament. I actually read it a few weeks ago when we talked about the return of Christ, and I want you to think about how full picture this is. One of the times is when Jesus was dying on the cross shrieking in pain, taking on our punishment in what seemed to look like complete failure. In Satan's eyes in that moment, God failed. But we know that Jesus came out of the grave. But not only came out of the grave, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a war cry, it's the same Greek word, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. How full picture is this? It's amazing. With one shriek, Jesus is dying, taking upon himself our sin, death, and hell of what we've all deserved. But one day, he's gonna let out that same shriek and war cry, and it won't be when he's dying. It will be when he's returning to make all things new. He's not just the savior that dies. He's the Lord that will return in glory. The second phrase I wanna talk about that Jesus said on the cross is it is finished. It is finished. 
What did he mean by that? The very last thing he said, it is finished. And that comes from John 19, 30. And he says exactly that. Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What's finished? I wanna take your attention now to Matthew 27, 51. And after Matthew is telling this story, he takes our attention from Golgotha, the mountain where Jesus was dying, and he reverts our attention, takes our attention to the temple, the Jewish temple. And it says this in verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. So, so what happens here? If you're watching a movie, you'd be like, we're watching one scene, and then it splits, and it takes us to another scene. The, the Jewish temple, why? Why does it talk about a curtain ripping from top to bottom? Because up until that point, the presence of God was not accessible to individual people. The presence of God, the holiness of God, the lethal, holy presence of God was kept behind the curtain, literally and symbolically at the same time. Kept behind the curtain, the veil in the temple. Only one Jewish religious leader could go back there once a year after going through all of the ceremonial rituals to become clean enough and good enough and holy enough to go into the presence of God. But on that day, when Jesus died, the curtain, the veil, tore. On that day, the statement God was making and what Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. What Jesus was saying is, the work is done that I came to do. Now all of mankind has access to God because I finished the work as the mediator. I am the mediator, what Jesus says, between God and man. I bridged the gap, the chasm, that was set in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a gap between God and man because of sin. Jesus came and the cross became the bridge. The veil was torn, the presence of God is now accessible to everyone. Jesus was cast out so we could be brought in. Jesus was rejected so we could be welcomed. So when Jesus said that phrase, that statement, it is finished. Specifically, here's what he was saying. It is finished. The sacrifice of all sacrifices is now done. The Passover lamb has died. Jewish people would have known exactly what he was claiming in that moment. Now I want you to think about this. Go back to the book of Exodus. What is the Passover? The Passover originates in Exodus. We'll go back, but think about what Pilate says Remember when he's bringing Barabbas and Jesus up? He says, we're entering into Passover, and it's a, it's a custom. Passover was starting, okay? And Jesus is calling himself, as he's dying on the cross, he is calling himself the Passover lamb, the ultimate sacrifice. Now let's go back to Exodus. In Exodus, the Jewish people were held captive in Egypt. Remember the story? The 10 plagues, the last plague, God tells Moses that a, uh, the death angel is coming and is going to kill all of the firstborn in the land. God didn't tell him he's gonna kill all the firstborn Egyptians, all of the firstborn. That's why the Israelites, God tells them, if you want your firstborn to live, you need to sacrifice a lamb, take the blood of a lamb, and put the blood of the lamb above the doorpost on your home. And when the death angel comes and sees the blood, the death angel will pass over your home and your home will be spared. So since that day occurred in Exodus, the Passover then and would remain the most important festival and holiday in the Jewish world. And at the time Jesus was dying, it was the beginning of the Passover, the Passover lamb. Now let's look at the Last Supper. Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples and he has the bread and he has the wine. There are three parts to the Passover meal. The bread, the wine, and the lamb. Can you imagine being the disciples that day? It's not recorded that they asked this, but they had to have been confused. Because he was trying to tell them the whole time, I'm not the kind of Messiah you think I am. We're not going to war like you think. I'm going to war, but I'm going to war with sin. I'm not going to war with Rome. And he's sitting there with them at the Last Supper, they have the bread, they have the wine, and you can imagine being the disciples looking at him and, and asking, where's the lamb? And Jesus would respond by saying, I'm the lamb. I'm the sacrifice. And then you fast forward to where we are on the cross, and Jesus is on the cross, and he says, it is 
finished. The sacrificial lamb has died. It is the sacrifice of all sacrifices. There are no more sacrifices needed for atonement. There are no more sacrifices needed for salvation. Jesus says the work of salvation is done. And when we call on the name of that Passover lamb, death will pass over because the blood of the lamb now is mine because I called on the name of Jesus. The blood of the lamb is above the doorpost of my life because I called on the name of Jesus and eternal death will pass over my life. It's interesting when you look at this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says this, this is Paul write, later writing, for indeed you are clean because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. What Jesus did on the cross, what he said on the cross, is the exact opposite. Go look up, it's fascinating. Go look up what every other recorded major world religion leader and founder, go look up all of their last words. What Jesus said on the cross, his last words, are the complete opposite of all of them. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So the last words of Buddha, strive without ceasing. Strive without ceasing. The last words of Jesus, it is finished. We serve a God that says it's not about striving and ceasing anymore. It's not about you becoming good enough for me to be your savior. It's not about you cleaning up your life before you come to God. It's not about looking into your past and saying I have too much, it's too filthy, it's too dirty. Jesus said it's not about striving anymore. What Jesus said is it is finished. What it is finished means is the work of salvation is done for you. Call on my name. The work of salvation is done. But it has been ingrained in us because of different groups in Christianity or different religions and different mindsets that it's all about what you do and what you do and what you do that leads you to salvation. And it's not. Does Jesus call us to obedience and discipleship? Yes, he does. But what Jesus is saying is obey because it's finished. Don't obey to finish it. Obey because it's finished. Our obedience and discipleship and our holiness is a response to what he did on the cross. It is not the means of getting us to the salvation that the cross provides. It is finished. The penalty for our sin has been paid. There's an old story that old time preachers tell that gave me a whole fresh perspective on this when I was a teenager. It's a story of a young woman driving home from college one night for Christmas and it's approaching a weekend and she's traveling through these little small towns and, and was speeding, trying to beat a storm. And a police officer pulls her over and she was going 100 miles per hour over the residential speed limit. So he had to arrest her and he had to take her in. With it getting ready to be a holiday, a lot of the government workers were getting done and going home and so things were crazy. And what makes the story worse is that after she was arrested, she had no relationship with her family that she was going home to visit because she had walked away from them um, she had thrown them under the bus. She, has been, she had been brutal to them. And she was actually on her way home to try to make amends with her family that at this point didn't want anything to do with her because she had made it very clear she didn't want anything to do with them. She had no one to call and nowhere to go. The judge heard the story about a young girl being brought in because of speeding and was gonna have to stay the weekend in jail. So he provided an avenue for her to sit in front of him in the small little courtroom in that small little town. And he stood on his judge's bench and he sat down and had his judge's robe on and had the gavel with him, and this young girl is sitting in front of him, and he looks at her and just says, I'm so sorry that this is happening, but the law is the law, and you have to pay $200, a $200 fine now, or you have to stay the weekend in jail. And she looked at him frantic and said, I don't have $200, I don't have it, and I have no one to call, I don't know what to do, I can't stay in jail, I can't do this, I'm driving home to make amends with my family, please help me, and he, he said, I wish I could, he said, I, the law is the law. You have to pay $200 or spend the weekend in jail. And she just put her head 
on the table and began to cry, just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. The next moment, as she's crying, she feels a hand on her shoulder and she looks up and she sees it was the judge. The judge had stood up from his bench and taken off his judge's robe, set down his gavel, and had walked down the steps and walked over to the girl, not as a judge, but as a man, next to the girl. And he opens, takes out his wallet and opens it and pulls out two $100 bills and sets it in front of her. He closes his wallet. He walks back to the bench, puts on his judge's robe, sits down, takes up his judge's gavel and says, young lady, the law is the law. You have to pay a $200 fine or you have to spend the weekend in jail. Do you have the money to pay the fine? And just crying and weeping, all she could do was hold up the two $100 bills as she was shaking and he had a smile on his face and she paid the fine and he said, you're free to go. There's no clear picture of salvation. We committed an offense through our sin and a, and a fine, the penalty has to be paid. There's a penalty for that sin. The wages of that sin, the Bible says, are, is death. But God the Father, the righteous judge, being merciful and true, sees us in this vulnerable state and took off his judge's robe and came as a man through Jesus, who stood next to us with his hand on our shoulder and provided, provided the penalty, the fine. And today in a moment like this, standing before God, we can hold up that payment in what Jesus did on the cross, shaking and trembling, knowing I did nothing to deserve this. It was provided for me and experiencing the love of what the cross actually means, maybe for the very first time. And the judge looks at us, not with vengeful, angry eyes, but with compassion and mercy and says, you're free to go. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. I'm gonna end with reading Romans 5, 8, and it says this, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes today, I wanna give you the opportunity today to receive Christ as your savior. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is call on the name of Jesus and we will be saved. You might have known about salvation and you might have known about the cross, but has it ever gone from your mind, from your head to your heart? Has it ever sunk so deep to where something shifted and changed, to where something was so overwhelming where you felt the mercy and grace cover the sins of your past and something begins to shift in your soul? Have you ever experienced that kind of love? Or have you made the cross a relic, something to look at rather than something to experience? Jesus is our Lord and Savior and came to die for us. If you would like to receive Christ as your Savior today, in a moment, I'm gonna to count to three, and if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand where you're at, and I'm asking you to raise your hand just so I can see you, to know who I'm praying for, but what saves us is a declaration. Confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, and the Bible says we will be saved. It has to be a declaration from your heart, a declaration from your soul. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Grace has already been done. Do you have the faith today? to say, I believe. If that's you and you would like to be included in this final prayer, on the count of three, if you just raise your hand right where you're at. One, two, three. Just have the boldness to raise it right where you're at and keep it up just for a second. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Keep them up just for a second. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. You can put them right back down after I see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome, a lot of hands went up. You can put them back down. I'm gonna pray and I'm asking you to make this prayer your own. A prayer itself doesn't save you. Remember, it's a declaration from your heart, your soul. Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for today. God, over every person in this room, God, you see every heart and every mind. There are people in this room right now who are surrendering their life to you, securing their home in eternity in heaven. Jesus, come into our lives. Change us. Forgive us. Thank you for paying the penalty for our sin, Jesus, on the cross. Thank you for keeping my name in your mind as you went to the cross. I'll never forget it. The work is done. 
We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.